The scripture reading uh, for today comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to his, this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the reading of God's word. This is, uh, today, this is the third sermon uh, on Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus. The first sermon was uh, uh, titled, Intrusive Grace. And second sermon was responding to grace. And last two Sundays, I talked about three things, those three points. The person of Zacchaeus, that he was rich, chief tax collector, uh, probably corrupt, and uh, wanted to see Jesus. Second point I talked about for two Sundays uh, was the promises of Jesus. Uh, Jesus inviting him to come down from the tree and inviting himself to go in to his house. And then third point was the response to grace. Uh, 50% of his goods, it says in English Standard Version, our reading, uh, that means his, uh, not just his property, but his income, his regular income, he'll give 50%, not 10%, but 50%, and uh, fourfold uh, restitution if he had cheated anyone uh, from people. Some of you have noticed, and some of you commented to me, that I haven't made a comment about Zach being small in stature, uh, short, that he was a, a short person. I didn't think it was important. Uh, and uh, I didn't think uh, that was the main point of Luke, when he mentioned that he was short, and I wanted to be sensitive uh, and, and not to comment on people's appearance, but Luke did, and Luke was probably, you know, 2,000 years ago, he, he wasn't culturally sensitive, maybe, uh, but in my limited experience of interacting with Korean people, I'm sure... Uh, other people of other cultures do this too, I'm sure. But in my limited experience of interacting with Korean people, they comment on people's appearance all the time. Uh, in front of you. <laughs> oh, you cut your hair. Oh, you lost weight. Oh, you're gaining weight. You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I know people of other cultures do that too, but they don't do that in front of you. Only Peter Ong does that in front of you. But I thought... The point of him, you know, short that Luke mentions is, is because he climbed up the tree and, and, that was, and, and he had strong desire and I thought that was the only point. But one of the theologians, not well known in this field, uh, less known, uh, named Eunice Kwan, uh, shared with me this, this uh, good insight with me. Uh, last Sunday, Zach, being short, she said that he always had to look up in his entire adult life, looked up to people. But when he climbed up the tree, uh, this tree of dishonor, embarrassment, and this tree is, is really a tree of almost like being made fun of, and uh, she said that was probably the first time 
that someone looked up to him, that he was looking down. That it was for probably first time that someone looked up and someone had a real conversation and it was first time looking down and having a real conversation with a real person and it happened to be Jesus. And treating him with honor and respect on the tree of dishonor and disrespect. That was really good. Then she said a couple of other things, and I told her, it's okay, this is, it's not as good as this one. <laughs> and then she was going on and on and texting me, and I said, oh, okay, thank you, this is, this is good. <laughs> that's good enough. Uh, thank you, Eunice, for your insight. <laughs> and I thought about that for a whole week. It was very good. Today's topic is grace to repent. And I shared with you last Sunday that we cannot talk about repentance without faith. We can't talk about faith without repentance. And repentance and faith must always go together. Uh, but some people ask, what comes first? Uh, chronologically and logically, what comes first? Repent and believe, or, or believe and repent? Do you believe first so that you're able to repent, or you repent first so that you're able to believe? Uh, this is a conversation probably for people who come to church all the time, but those of you who are visiting for the first time and you're new, sorry, and, and this is probably important, and, and, and we'll get to this, why this is important for all of you, all of you. What comes first? Or there's, there's an attempt to separate the two. Of course, there are two distinct things, repentance and faith. But they're inseparable. Inseparable. So even logically, it's hard to separate. This is what uh, John Murray, one of the great theologians, more known uh, theologian, uh, this is what he wrote in his book. In his book, uh, accomplished, uh, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. Uh, rather long quote, but I, I think this is a good reading. Uh, the, uh, the faith that is unto salvation is a penitent faith, and the repentance that is unto life is a believing repentance. Faith is faith in Christ for salvation from sin. But if faith is directed to salvation from sin, there must be hatred of sin and the desire to be saved from it. Such hatred of sin involves repentance. Again, if we remember that repentance is turning from sin unto God, the turning to God implies faith in the mercy of God as revealed in Christ. It is impossible to disentangle faith and repentance. Saving faith is permeated with repentance, and repentance is permeated with faith. So we'll talk about two things today. Repentance and faith, faith and repentance, and the life of repentance and faith, and faith and repentance. Since faith and repentance cannot be separated, I'll mention the two under this one heading. Repentance, when I talk about repentance, just think of the opposite of repentance and you'll get to faith. Repentance is turning away from sin, and faith is turning to Jesus. In Christian vocabulary, repentance is turning away from sin. In Christian language, re re faith is turning to Jesus. So repentance is you're going here this direction, and then you turn, and then you have to go the opposite direction. That's faith. Turning away from sin. But we have to ask this fundamental question. What is sin? Is repentance, if repentance is turning away from sin, what is sin? Traditionally, Christians have taught that sin is breaking of God's law. When you break God's law, you're sinning. That's why God gave Ten Commandments. You break Ten Commandments, you're sinning. But there are three components of repentance. First, admitting and acknowledging the problem of sin. Second is feeling sorry for sin, the godly sorrow, regret. And third is actually leaving. And then that's where faith comes in and works together. So admitting, feeling, and turning. So it's rational, 
emotional and volitional. Those three components have to work together. But, but let's do a case study on this. What was Zacchaeus' sin? What was his issue? Let's identify. We, we read this passage for three Sundays. You probably memorized this by now. Cheating people, collecting more taxes for his own benefit, stealing people. He was evil, corrupt. He manipulated others. And uh, he, he, he manipulated the system as well to hurt other people, uh, especially the poor. But we must ask this question. Okay, we call all these things sin. But what made him do all these things? What made him? Why was he so evil? Why was he so corrupt? And why was he so greedy? Why? When we talk about sin, we can't, talk about, we can't just talk about what. We've got to talk about why. Why did he do this? Come on now, don't get my Baltimore out of me. Uh, I want to be as straightforward as I can. Why? Because he loved money. I mean, we can say it right, he loved money. Here's a sin of stealing, cheating, manipulating, collaborating with power to disadvantaged poor. That was his problem, sin, and the sin underneath the sin was the love of money. He loved money. You see, money has a strange power to make us happy or miserable. Money is not always bad. Money can make you happy. But it can also make you miserable. Married people fight about money. Married people fight about money all the time. American uh, psychologists or socialists, sociologists say that, uh, that uh, one, one, number one cause of marital conflict is money. People fight about money. How about, how about you guys, married people? When's the last time you fought about money? Those of you who have money fight about money. Those of you who don't have money fight about money. You get nervous when ministers talk about money. Ministers get nervous talking about money. This is what uh, David Geffen said. Anyone who thinks money will make you happy hasn't got money. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> wow, okay, that's good. Uh, well, this particular story is interesting because it's about Zacchaeus converting from love of money to love of Jesus. That's his conversion story. This is a conversion story of converting from love of money to love of Jesus. In his book, uh, The Mission of God, Christopher Wright surveys the Old Testament and finds at least four things, he, he says, from which we tend to manufacture gods or idols. These are the four things. He observes that we can make gods out of things that entice us, creating things that are greater than us, stronger than us, charming to us, uh, that, uh, that we can be enticed to worship. Whatever you love, you're going to worship. Whatever you love, you're going to think that is worthwhile and you're going to give your time and energy, and you're going to commit to that. Anything that entices you, that can be an idol, Christopher Wright says. Second, we can make gods from things we fear. People imagine that some things in creation that, uh, that, really, that really aren't gods should be feared, and more, feared more than gods. I mean, I mean we, we always think about all these things, even in our culture, uh, we can fear people. Some of us fear people's opinion uh, more than God. And for Zach and for uh, many of us, we fear becoming poor, financially insecure. 
was before I, I told you the story of, of, of this uh, couple that I know. Uh, he's a lawyer, she's a doctor, pretty well off. And I had a real good conversation with them one time, and I said, what's your greatest fear in life? She said, becoming poor. I said, go ahead. But that's real. That's real. We can make gods out of things we trust. We think something can deliver us and give us satisfaction and meaning in life. We sacrifice all kinds of stuff, including our marriage and families. We sacrifice even our children to get whatever that we think can give us some kind of meaning, hope, joy in life. This is what I tell young church planners all the time. When I train young church planners, I say, do not offer your children up to the altar of church plant. <laughs> Come on now. I got to get my handkerchief. Uh, financial security, whatever. Whatever we trust. We can manufacture gods out of things we need. Of course, there are things we need. We all know that. But we quickly convert our needs to our wants and our desires. And, and we're experts at that. And we think we need. We can hear in our conversation. I need to find a good parking spot this morning. That's not really your need. But it's, it's embedded in our hearts and, our, and mind. But Zacchaeus, he was enticed by money. For Zacchaeus, he trusted money. For Zacchaeus, he thought he needed money to have this ultimate thing that he thought he needed. Or perhaps his life was gripped by fear that he needed to accrue wealth. Just in case. Just in case I need to have more. He idolized money. He worshipped money. But somehow he heard about Jesus. As you all know, those of you who have been here before, someone talked to him about Jesus, and here he is. In the latter passage, he's dining with his Savior. Jesus showed him grace. Now he's a changed man. From this account, we learn that grace is always God's initiative and never a man's initiative. Yeah, Zacchaeus had to humble himself and climb up the tree to see Jesus, but ultimately it was not Zacchaeus who asked Jesus to come into his life, but Jesus who asked Zacchaeus into his. It's almost as though Jesus was joyfully laughing and saying, Zacchaeus, you, Zacchaeus, I know you. You, yes, you, come down. I'm not going to other place. I'm going to your house. And grace always confuses many people. Grace always confuses people, especially the religious people. Especially for religious people, grace is confusing. When I preach grace over and over and over again, there are religious people who come to me and say, but you have to talk about what they have to do. You're like, uh, and they don't understand the power of grace. Zacchaeus knew without a doubt that he was clearly the one who was the worst one, even among the tax collectors. Tax collectors. Yet, Jesus chose him. In this way, Zacchaeus began to understand that salvation was only by grace. Salvation was only, only by grace. And I say this over and over again, so you like, oh gosh, whatever. But grace is such a, a beautiful and comforting word. 
Grace can touch and reach the worst kinds of people. Grace can lift up the weak and heal the broken. It's only by grace that we are here in this room for worship and call Jesus our Lord and Savior and only by grace. And sometimes people ask my mother, how did you raise your sons in this way? She says, only by grace. Sometimes people ask me, how did, I say, only by grace. It's grace, grace, grace. If I had a daughter, I was going to name her Grace. Grace. Law cannot change. You want to change some things about your children? Grace. Rather than putting these reminders, I mean, these are great things, what to do, maybe, maybe try grace. And what that looks like. And how to receive it, live it. How did grace change Zacchaeus? Verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I store it fourfold. What happened to Zacchaeus? All of a sudden, he became generous. He was doing everything he could to accrue wealth and to be rich just in case, probably. Or he enjoyed power that came with it. Or pleasure. Money to make you happy. From Zacchaeus' response to Jesus' grace, we can say that there is no powerful force than anything else, but he became generous. 50% of his earning. Promised to pay back four times of all the people whom he cheated, probably everyone, except for his relatives, or probably. When Zacchaeus tasted the grace of Jesus, money no longer had control over him. When grace ruled Zacchaeus' heart, he gave 50% instead of 10% according to law. Christians give about 10%. But he said, I'm giving 50%. When grace rules Zacchaeus' heart, he paid back four times, which would amount to about 300, 400% interest. Paying back 20% interest was required by the law, but three to 400%. In other words, when Zacchaeus tasted the grace of Jesus, he did. More, not less. Grace doesn't leave you, but grace lifts you. Let me summarize. This is what repentance and faith look like for Zach. First, admit, acknowledge the problem of sin. He knew money was a problem. He didn't say, Lord Jesus, thank you for calling me. Thank you for inviting me into your life. Now, now I'm going to read five chapters of the Bible every day. Now I'm going to wake up early in the morning to pray like them Korean people. He didn't say that, you see. That wasn't his issue. His issue was money. That's why he saw it. He acknowledged money was his problem. He admitted his love for money. And he felt sorry. He had godly sorrow. And, and, and he probably, I'm, I'm reading into it, of course, he probably, and I'm, I'm imagining, saw all these faces, seeing all these faces suffering and struggling financially. Their children struggling. Parents. You know what? I'm going to give 50% to the poor. I'm going to give fourfold. I feel bad now. I feel bad. 
feel bad for what I did. And third, he had to leave. He felt so bad that he decided to give and to follow Christ. And that faith is the opposite side. Acknowledging the problem of sin and needing need for Christ. Hatred and sorrow for sin and affection for Jesus. Leaving sin and following and fellowshipping with Christ. Don't just leave. You gotta go. So this has to be a lifestyle. This has to be your life pattern. It's a lifestyle of repentance and faith. Turn away from idolatry of money. Don't believe the lies. Turn to Jesus and know that he's the only one who's there for you because he was there for you on that tree. He was the one who became poor for you. He was the one who lost his heavenly glory and honor, and he was the one who was humiliated to give you honor. He was there. He never left. It's not like the idols that we make up out of fear, out of need, out of desperation, and you sacrifice everything. Your idols will never sacrifice anything for you. Your idols will never die for you. Your idols will leave you. But Jesus will never leave you. He's one who left security, comfort, glory. So come. We know that. Christians know that. So we cling to him, and we have to be reminded of that truth every day and every week. And that's one of the reasons why we come here. And that's one of the Job descriptions for a minister of God's word to remind you this. I know that many people say this. I don't know if I'm a Christian or become a Christian since I have different views. Like homosexuality, gender issues, abortion, and other issues. I don't know if I'm a Christian. I don't believe in some of the things that you believe. Hey, you don't have to have certain views to become a Christian. All you need to believe is that Jesus loves you and he died for you and rose again for you. That he cares for you. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to believe. We have, there are many different views, you see. We sang this praise this morning. Majesty. Was that the song, Majesty? <laughs> Jesus found me just as I am. We sang that. Maybe a different song. Is that the same song? Yeah. See, Jesus found me just as I am. With your views. With your different views. With your different lifestyle. Yes. You don't have to change to come to Jesus. You meet Jesus. That's what happens. And then you see what grace will do for you. It's grace, you see. Do you believe in death and resurrection? Do you admit that you're broken and so lost that Jesus had to die for you? Do you believe that you're so precious that Jesus rose again and made you righteous? Do you believe that? Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? That's all that matters. Do you believe that? That's all you need. All you need is need. All you need is your need and your willingness to welcome Jesus into your life. It's already 11.26 and I have to end my sermon, but let me share this illustration that I heard from this preacher from Ohio named Alistair Begg. He shared this story in the sermon, and I listened to it, and I said, yo, this is really good. So good. He was talking about how, how the thief on the right side of Jesus went to heaven. 
to be with the Lord, paradise. And he's giving a story, of course, his imaginative story. I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was pretty sound and orthodox. And here is this guy on the right side of Jesus on the cross, the thief, and he's going to heaven, and Peter is standing like a big bouncer. How do you think you can get into heaven? Why are you here? What do you know? What do you do? Of course, he didn't say all these things. I'm making up now. Uh, what's your view? What's your view on predestination? Are you five-point Calvinist or four-point? What's your view on some of these social issues? Probably asked or didn't, but he only had one answer. And his answer was, the guy in the middle told me I could come. The guy in the middle told me I could come. That's the only basis. The guy in the middle is inviting you to come. Especially our youth students, confused about different views. The guy in the middle is still inviting you and saying, I love you. I care for you. I died for you. You see. And this is how we can live. Let me close with this. Revelation 3, verse 14 to 22. And to the angel of church in Laodicea, write, the words of the Amen. The faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you either, hot, either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich. I've prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself. Shame your nakedness may not have seen, not be seen and solve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me at my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father in his throne. He who has the ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. One of the most amazing things, the whole passage is, is that in the beginning Jesus says, you're useless, neither hot or cold. I want to spit you out of my mouth. It's basically saying I'm about to gag because you're just useless. And then he comes back a little down and then says, I, to those I love, I reprove and discipline and show tough love. Therefore, repent. Then he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open, I will come in, and I will eat with him and him with me. You probably know that in ancient times, to come into someone's house and eat with them, to be invited in, that's intimate fellowship and friendship. What is Jesus saying here? Well, a lot of evangelists, a lot of people say that, uh, you know, use this as the evangelism tool and say, Jesus is knocking, bring Jesus into your life. It's okay to use that metaphor that way. I think you're not, you're not, you're not uh, committing a huge, unforgivable, hermeneutical crime, I don't think. But that's not how it's used. That's not what Jesus is saying. This is written to Christians. Jesus is writing to the church. He's inviting you, the church, and he says, let's have fellowship. Even you Christians, you're stuck on these things. Here's what it means. When you sit down, when you sit with me, when you're praying, 
Are you seeking fellowship with Jesus or are you just taking me for granted or just trying to use me and get things? When you come to worship, are you just going through the motion or really communing with Jesus? It ought to be lifestyle. All right, I'll just go through the motion. Okay, now I'm in a church chair. <laughs> Autopilot. Stand when you need to stand. Sit when you need to sit. All right, offering time. Oh, QR code. All right, I open up my phone. Pretend I'm doing it. And oh, that's wow. Barack Obama is really following Peter. I thought, I thought he was going to say, Barack follows me, but I follow Jesus. <laughs> but, but it's so great that he ended there. That's, that's why Peter's awesome. Uh, he's not cheesy. You see, it's a lifestyle of faith and repentance. And you do that over and over again. You take off your old clothes and you put on the new. You walk away from idols. And you cling to Jesus. You take one step, another step, another step. And your idol grips you and makes you afraid and insecure. And you're going to take a couple steps back. And then you realize, and then you go back again, over and over. Faith is rejoicing in Jesus for his amazing grace. Repenting is replacing your idol with deep hatred. Deep hatred for that idol that chokes you. Replace it and rejoice with Jesus. Do that every day. And that's why we have this beautiful sign and seal of God's grace for us. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal, he took the cup and said, this is my blood, a blood of new covenant for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink it in remembrance of me. And he says, every time you do this, every time you're proclaim proclaiming the gospel, he says, remember, we need to be reminded. And here we are, we're reminded again. Just imagine the things that enticed you, the things that you feared, the things that you trusted, things that you thought you needed, things you thought were going to give you happiness. Or think about these things that's getting in the way of going to Christ. He says, I'm knocking at the door. I'm constantly knocking. I know you don't have the right motive all the time, but that's okay. I'm still knocking. I'm still knocking. And he's committed to us. So let's come before the Lord and remember and come to Christ. I hope those of you who are joining us at home can join soon. Those of you who are not ready, I hope you can join as well. Those of you young people who are still asking, please continue, continue to do that. And I hope you can come and then you can join us. This is a sign and seal of our communion with our sweet Savior. He wants to come in and dine with us. So let's pray. Let's just uh, take uh, 30 seconds or so, just quietly, if you're taking communion. If you're not, just quietly, just think about what does this all mean? Why are they doing this? Maybe this is a great opportunity that God has invited you to this be here to ask these questions.
Lord Jesus, what's holding us back? What's keeping us from opening our heart to you? We pray, Lord, that you would continue to show us and remind us of your love and grace. Care for us. Be committed to us. And give us faith to turn away and to look to you. For faith is your gift to us. We can't manufacture it. We can't produce it. We can't work at it. But you give us as your gift. We pray that you open our eyes and open our hearts as we receive. Jesus, your body, your blood given for us. This is a proof of your commitment to us. So we receive with thanksgiving and with great joy for Jesus' sake.